afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Firefish Cranecast. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I'm hearing that there's sunshine all over and Scotland, surprising enough, apparently has got some sunshine there as well. So I hope you're having a lovely week and a lovely afternoon. I'm joined by um, Angela Kritz from Recruiting Gym, um, who um, I've just, we've just been discussing has, it's not often we meet somebody that's still hands on the recruitment industry that has more than 20 years experience in the recruitment industry. You have 30. You started a long, long time ago, and you still love it, which is brilliant. Um, you've been a variety of different roles, executive coach, mentor, board advisor. So I'm really um, privileged that you're able to come spend some time with us um, and you know, not only be a, a, an advisor to the market, but you're also a personal friend. So thank you, Angela. Do you want to start off by just saying hello and giving us a little bit of background about what you've been getting up to and running in terms of the recruitment gym? Yes, definitely. So yeah, we're coming up for 33 years next month. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't believe it either, but, but <laughs> I, love, I love this industry. It's amazing. Uh, the recruiting gym, I took over January last year from Alex Moyle. So people that know Alex Moyle, we set it up about three years ago. And uh, it was going to be about 10, 20% online. Uh, I got involved January 2020. So you, we all know what happened next. It all went 100% online. So we've been working hard during that time. We didn't have any time off. We've all been working hard. Um, we went from two coaches and four online courses to 27 coaches and 107 online courses now. So, yeah, that's all available for, for people. And we offer six free ones. So we do want to get information out there to help our industry as much as possible. You have been very busy and uh, providing a good service at the right time, I think, as well, just uh, in terms of when, when COVID hit everyone. So it's been an interesting journey for, for you, as, as I know. And, and that's what we're going to touch on today. We're going to look at, you know, engaging and empowering your teams for growth, because, um, you know, we've been going into different sort of markets. We're in a situation where we're going into the next six months. We're, half, we're at that half year point. Um, of you know what do we look at after the summer holidays and and how do we sort of continue to grow and um, so I think that's probably the first thing or where I want to start off with because I know I've talked to lots of recruitment owners who used to look at their business plan for three years in advance a year in advance etc um, but you know how, mu how much further what should we be looking at in terms of our business plan for the next six months how should we be doing that how fixed should we do it you know keep it from the, the, the start of the year What's your advice in that area? Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. We always used to do three-year business plans and, and then everything went haywire. So for me, it was it was scope out the three years, think about where you want to go, and especially with staffing. If you're going to grow your team, just don't expect it to just happen. It probably won't. You've got to really put some planning into this. So breaking that down from three years to two, one, and then down into quarters. So if we're looking at the next two quarters by the end of the year, there's loads of things that people can be doing right now to help and support them. And we know it's difficult to get um, experienced consultants, let's say, or recruiters, whether you're in-house or agency. <coughs> it, it, it's really tough at the moment, isn't it? So people have got to the point where they're looking at bringing in new people from other industries so that they can actually uh, train and develop them. But of course, that's going to take a lot of work as well. Yeah. And I know something I, I, I sort of we put into our business every six months as well is that, you know, just as much as looking at the growth elements, but we're also just looking at, you know, in terms of the costs and the spend and anything we don't need, because sometimes where we've just come into, um, you know, from a recruitment point of view, I know everybody's been flying in the last six months. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes you can be purchasing lots of bits of things that you maybe don't need going forward. It was just when when it was too busy, you're just like, yeah, this is fine. So actually doing a little bit of a budget and sort of cost analysis there to see if there's anything you don't need going forward as well. It's, it's a really good thing to do on a quarterly basis. So just looking at your P&Ls and, and establishing and looking, OK, what's the outgoings? What's my burn, as it were, um, on a monthly basis? And do, doing a cull. It's a bit like you do with your Facebook. Yes, <laughs> Let's have a look through. Who's actually helping here? Who's giving me joy? Who's in? So again, maybe we're linked in as well from our connections. Who are the people that I love hearing from? Let's let's make sure we actually uh, generate some more work with those and uh, develop relationships. But you do need to cut out the, de the dead wood. So whether that's people or whether that is through your business and, and yeah, like you say, the bit, bits of tech, tech and the elements that are costing you money that you're not using. I think we're all sitting there now going, yeah, there is something. 
yeah. I need, need to look at because I'm not using it properly. Mm. Either either do it and do yeah. it well, or if it's not helpful, then yeah, get get rid of it in that sense. Mm. Good. So we go and we have a look at it from a strategy point of view, maybe from the owner, and then we go down to our teams and we say, right, this is you know this is the plan for the next six months in terms of how that's addressed. But how do you get your teams then actually engaged with that? Yeah, so so starting point, um, think about your objectives. Think about what do I need to achieve by the end of the year? So this should link into that annual plan. You'll know where you want to get to. Break it down into the quarters. Here's the focus. And don't just have one that's money because everyone gets that and that's easy. But that doesn't help you with the how. If you just give targets to people that's just money and leave it at that, they might get there, they might not. So for for your team to engage, they need to understand, well, what elements are actually going to move this forward? Now, I did um, work, it must be about eight years ago now, with Growth Accelerator through the government. A lot of people uh, were aware of that. It was about doubling your revenue, your people, or your profits. Mm -hmm. Those three were the criteria, and you have to double within three years. Now, this is sort of 2012, gosh, 10 years ago then, coming out of the recession, and actually, recruiters could do all three of those in, in that time. And 96% of something like 27,000 companies that went through it achieved that. Wow. So it was amazing. It was really good. So the, the initial part was get eight objectives. Think about, yes, your revenue, but it might be a gross profit. It might be a net profit, depending on what, what level you are within the business. But then what's going to help to support that? So staffing, obviously, is a key one. Are you developing that? Are you growing your team? Do you want to move forwards with that? But it might also be profitability per person. Mm -hmm. So it's no good just growing the team and they're all pretty much doing not much at all. If if you're not developing the individuals within it and helping their profitability, then actually you're going to go backwards in the end because you're going to use up a lot more of your um, net costs um, and you're going to cut into that profit. So... Staffing, yes. It could be also um, a fill rate, something simple like that that you could have focused on. Taking all these jobs in, we know everyone is really, really busy. So everyone should know what their fill rate is at the moment, whether that's perm, temp, contract, doesn't matter. Of the opportunities you're getting, how many are you actually filling? So whether you do it as a percentage or a ratio, whatever speaks to you more. So percentages tend to talk. Um, a lot more to people. So are you filling at least 50% of your perm jobs and 80% of your temp and contract roles that you get an opportunity of? And if you're way off of that, then put that as part of your strategy over this next six months to a quarter and address why not. Mm -hmm. Look at the details. Does it go wrong at the end? Is it halfway through? Where is it dropping out? And it could be then those ratios you then look into. I, I'm a bit of a KPI freak, I must admit. Listen, you're, you're talking to a data friend. So, you know, the, the answers are always in the data. So, yeah, I, I, I agree, you know. Exactly. Um, I've written a few blogs on it. We'll find them. We'll put, we'll put them in yeah. there so that uh, people have made data. But if, you, if you're not monitoring it, if you're not analysing it, then you don't know whether you're going to get there at the end of the year or not. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a little bit of a wish and a prayer. So having that data and having that backup, and then it's not telling your team what they've got to do, doesn't go down very well, does it? So actually getting them to work it out for themselves, getting them to realize that their ratios, their data will be different to the company's overall, and therefore what do they need to do individually to achieve what they need to achieve? That then starts getting buying because they've created their plan for themselves. So I'm a real advocate of quarterly business plans for people within the team so that they can actually plot out well what are their objectives some of them you want them relevant to the company or to the teams others you want them to add their individuality to it what, where's their focus what do they need to work on that they can then put that into their plan now it's still all the what and the why it's not the how and of course that's where the the, the training and the development to help them to be better at what they do that's where that kicks in and you can have some fun with that as well, can't you? Because, you know, the idea of the quarterly business plan, I think that's a, you know, I've taken that. We we should be doing, um, you know, the quarterly business plan presenting back, you know, each of your, you know, each of the recruiters or each of the, you know, the, the sales for me in terms of growth team, they should be saying, right, this is what I'm wanting to achieve this quarter. And actually having that where you're all presenting to one another, because that helps to share that accountability. 
something we used to do. And I think a lot of these tactics have just been changed since COVID and how we've been fighting our way through and sort of we then got really, really busy. But they're, they're great things that now we should be remembering those old school tactics and bringing them back to that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they shouldn't have gone in the middle, really, because it was that that really helped people. Now, you, we changed the targets during COVID because the revenue mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily realistic. Yeah. But activity definitely was, Mm -hmm. and therefore activity versus those results on the earlier end of the process. So it might not be the end result, might not be getting new clients, might not be getting new jobs at that point, but you could then adapt it and change. So you made sure that you worked on the stuff that was motivational. A lot of people, Mm -hmm. because, because it wasn't end result stuff, dropped it totally and haven't brought it back because, oh, they're so busy, we're just letting them get on with it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And it's so easy, isn't it? So easy just to roll from month to month, and we're suddenly going, "Oh, it's the summer holidays," you know, and and that's what we've got to avoid. Yeah, no, I mean, it's we know time just flies by. So when mm-hmm. I talk about quarterly planning to consultants, actually, the question I ask, and and I did this recently in a training course, is, um, okay, how far in advance do you actually plan? And we were lucky to get to next week with the, like a group of ten. <laughs> But really? two, this week, everything is in the diary this week. They're planning, planning, planning. Couple had actually thought about next week already and putting meetings in there. No one was thinking a month ahead, a quarter ahead, or to the end of the year. Yeah. And just taking time out to actually review what they were doing. And that's where the engagement comes in. Otherwise, you're just head down day to day, banging away, hoping you're going to get somewhere. And you will get somewhere. Probably mm-hmm. isn't where you want to hit your Yeah. And, and how often do you think or recommend that those teams are getting together to review, review those plans? You know, once they've done it at the start of the quarter, does that mean that we could just put it in a top drawer and forget about that plan? How do you get the engagement continued? No, because the first thing they've got to do is put it all into their calendars, into their diary, <laughs> whatever they're doing. OK, what have I got to achieve by when? Mm-hmm. Um, so that quarter gets broken down into months and that's your monthly performance review. So again, mm-hmm. we're back to performance management and making sure people have got the opportunity to talk about what they're doing what they're achieving their good bits the bits aren't working and therefore where do they need the support so so running a team your responsibility is to make them as best as they possibly can be and and having those opportunities to sit down now you're going to have newbies that just need tell me tell me tell me um and then you're going to have experienced people potentially where you've got to be careful about the number exercise it's more about what's your plan, what's your strategy, where are you, what help do you need? Mm-hmm. T- tell me about the successes. How are we going to use that with the rest of the team? How can we make sure that they see you as the expert and you can pull it in? So I'm, I'm referencing things here that are um, situational leadership, SL2. Mm-hmm. Um, so treating people differently, four different leadership styles, dependent on the person, their abilities, their motivation to do it. And also, yeah, the task itself. So it's individual per task. So you don't have a blanket way of treating everyone. There's that adaptability that's really important. And I know you've come up with certain frameworks that you've helped in terms of um, you know, empowering people to go on to them. Do you want to talk us a wee bit through some of those tool sets that you use? Yes, I know in the link, we've got the, the green link there. So go and have a look at uh, some of these as we're talking. The empowerment framework, I try and share as much as possible. It's a simple four box framework. Um, so four boxes, which you put all of their activities in. So this is something you do at their appraisal, annual appraisal, their six monthly review of that as well um, to update. So you don't do the appraisal twice in the year, you do it once and then you get all the documents out because that does get put in a drawer, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and you make sure that you're on track six months ahead. So the appraisal is all about them, their individuality, where they're going with the business, what's their plans, where do they want to be, is there promotion, advancement for them and what do they need to achieve over the next six months or so to, to be on track with that. This was something my manager, um, I was a manager um, at 23 mm-hmm. and I always wanted to make sure everything was perfect. All the I's dotted, T's crossed, and she got fed up with me checking (laughs) with her, as managers do. So if this is ringing true for you, it's like, your people keep coming and checking, you're like, no, yes, you can do that, go ahead. Um, Then actually, the empowerment framework's for you, because this is about grabbing all of those activities they do, so get it from their job specs, I haven't got job specs, we'll be speaking about that in a moment, Um, and then allocating it to the four boxes. So the four boxes are go. Okay, these are all the jobs you can just do. You don't have to tell anyone about it. You just do it. Carry Mm -hmm. on. Don't worry. That's part of your role. 
So you wouldn't do this for a newbie because they're not going to have that. You're going to need to be checking on everything. But at, at six months, maybe at their probation, this would be a good time to bring it in as well. The next box is ask, then go. So in other words, just check. With, oh, sorry, I've got it around the wrong way. Go, then let know. <laughs> so go, then let know is you can do it. Go ahead. But let me know afterwards what happens. So things like client meetings, you're always going to want to update the team. You always want to go and tell people what's happened. So that's always going to be a go, then let know. Fourth, third box is ask, then go. In other words, check with me first before you do it, please. <laughs> so this could be a negotiation to a certain level. There might be some things they can do themselves, but after that, you need to check with me first. And then the final box is no go. So these aren't things part of your job at the moment, but let's now have a conversation about the next six months. What would you like to get involved in? What would you like to be part of? Which projects, which information, which special things are happening that maybe we could add into your job? Or for the next level up, these are tasks that you will be doing. So you're not there yet. Let's put them in the box so that we're aware of them and we need to build them in over the next six to 12 months. So we'll start moving them to the other box. So you've got go, go then let know, ask then go, and no go. So they're the four boxes. So this is an easy way for people to see what permissions have I got? You're allowing them to just carry on because you've given them permission to do it. So if there's a mistake made, it's down to the manager. And that's what my boss said to me is, look, right, you go and do it. Here's your budget. Six months. I don't want you asking me what you've got to spend your money on. <laughs> go and do it. Tell me afterwards what you got from it. Now, of course, conscientious wise, I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to make spend frivolously. I'm going to make sure that when I went back to her and, that, and I flew, the business flew, um, we went from two to 11 staff in two years and from 150,000 turnover to 3.3 million in two years. Um, and this is what, nearly 30 years ago now. Not, not bad for a 23 year old, do you? <laughs> exactly, yes, that hadn't had management experience really. So th this was all that growth, learning through that empowerment framework and bit of giving people permission to make mistakes. The likelihood is they won't. If they do, then you have the discussion and it's okay, we put it in that box, we're going to have to drop it down. Very rarely happens, to be honest, but it's there just in case you need to. It's, it's a bit like when you promote someone. We talked about those career plans. Always have a probation period with the new job because we lose so many people either out of the industry or out of companies because they get promoted. Let's talk about the amazing consultant that gets promoted to manager. Two totally different jobs. So they may not be successful at it. They may not like it. So yeah. actually what we'd like is that probation period. They still go through assessments. They still get the chance to discuss. They have a probation period at the end. And they get the chance to say, actually, no, this isn't for me. They can go back to the job they were doing. Maybe they can make a sideways move, something different. But at least the conversation's there. And everyone knows this is a trial. It might work. It might not work. And therefore, keep them in the business, whatever. They were brilliant, so don't lose them. Um, so hopefully there's not too many people that are um, sort of realising now that, yeah, that was the mistake that they made. It, it's such a valid point because I think, um, you know, promoting and going through different promotions can be such a sensitive sort of um, topic if, you, if it's not done well. Because you've got everybody probably that is ambitious who comes in and just wants to fly up, but they don't actually... They haven't taken the time out to actually realise what the different jobs are. They don't almost care what those jobs are. They just want to see progression and that's what they think they're going to do. But actually understanding that trial period of what this job is and what it's actually about and whether or not, because at the end of the day, once you start climbing that ladder, you end up doing less of probably what you came into the industry to do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a realisation with any career um, ladder that you climb and you've got to want to go and do less of the actual hands-on practical side of things because your job becomes much more coaching management and you know in, in empowering individuals to succeed rather than perhaps focusing on yourself to succeed so it's yeah. a it's a really I, I relate to what you're just saying and I think some people you know sort of question me as to why we don't just promote and let them you know that's them I said no I want them to see them doing that job a little bit more before we throw them into giving them the title because essentially when that has happened you know they fall and I don't want them to fall and not be supported yeah the the, the support that you give them and letting them know that it's okay it's a different job it may work mm -hmm. it may not um mm -hmm. but yeah or they stick it and they're really bad at it yeah and then it becomes a different problem and that's not great either if you don't want to have that conversation uh, because maybe 
handling conflict, difficult conversations might not be your thing. Um, I know, I know we, we, that that's a course actually that that's come up more and more in this last year, mm-hmm. um, which I wouldn't have thought of before. But we, we have Claire Davis in mental health and well-being, and she's created those courses because people aren't having those difficult conversations anymore. They're backing off. You and I, we are old school. We're quite happy. <laughs> to move forward and actually we had a conversation about it before we started yeah. didn't we? those conversations have got to happen and sometimes it's all that person needs to actually make a difference um and if you're not doing it as their manager if you're not leading them and helping them to grow in that way then actually you're doing them a disservice by mm-hmm. not having the conversation mm-hmm. yeah and then it's just a wee bit more of a shock so I mean, other things that you've sort of looked at as well, I'm sure you've seen some, you know, mistakes that people have made that are quite common and how to, um, you know, how to counteract those mistakes. Are you able to sort of share some that have been coming up in the marketplace we've had in the last sort of six, 12 months? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of businesses where they were quite small and they're taking advantage of the market as it is at the moment. And of course, if, if you want a larger company, then go for it. Having been in it this long, this is sort of potentially the fourth recession that that I'll be going through. It never lasts. The good times, the bad times, everything changes. Yeah, we always know it won't last. So you've got to be prepared for that. So those people that are riding high at the moment and saying, I don't need to do BD because uh, business development, because we've got so many opportunities, then actually... No, you you do. You do need to do it now. You don't want immediate business. You want to be working on those long-term relationships mm-hmm. and getting your people to be having conversations, identifying opportunities for the future that are recession-proof. So if you haven't even thought about that yet, that's a big mistake. You need to be thinking about that now. You need to be identifying which companies you would like to do business, knowing that they're going to be carrying on even if there is a, a recession. So do some analysis on that. Train your people up to, to ask the questions, make sure they're gathering as much information and they're building relationships over a period of time because it might take six, nine months before you'll get an opportunity with them. And that might be about the right time um, that this is going to hit. Fingers crossed. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but we've been talking about this for a little while now. Don't leave it till the market starts changing. You'll be too late. You'll be behind the curve and other people will have signed up with these businesses. Um, so you do need to make sure that you tie them down as well. Get service level agreements, get get um, contracts if you can uh, to work with them. So that that's a key thing. The other thing is not taking a moment to step back and go, well, what is it that we've got to attract our staff so if we're growing yeah why are we different why should they choose us they've got so much choice at the moment why would they choose us but also how are you making sure you retain them don't go through all that effort get them in and then don't give them a chance don't help them with their onboarding and and train them and develop them and give them those opportunities potentially to fail but to be successful as well because if you're not doing that and having a plan for it and you're just leaving it to chance then again the likelihood people won't stay. So we want to make sure they can see a future, a long-term future with development um, because their purpose is key to them. I've got something I'm just going to quickly share, actually, because I think this will help people to sort of see how it um, all fits together. So the key thing is they could probably look at this and go, right, what have I actually got? What am I working? So this is something I created called the People Plan. So it starts with job specs, so job description and person specifications. We know they're two different things. We've just bundled them together to say job specs. So have you got those for everyone? Is there a career plan? Can they see? Even if you're a four or five person company, you could have seven levels that someone could go through. From joining you as a trainee to being a senior person and a manager, there's lots of opportunities. That's one of the recruitment industry. You can create your own jobs as you go along. But is there criteria for progression or is it that your face fits? And that's one of the big things that people make mistakes they recruit people like themselves and you end up with a bunch of clones <laughs> they're all good at the same type of things and that's not how you build a high performing team so look at what you don't have where are your strengths but where are your development areas what's missing in your team so belbin's a great theory for this nine different um, areas of, of opportunity there of, of different skill sets and one person can have three or four so you can have the perfect team with four people. Uh, you don't have to have nine people, but you do want to make sure that you're recruiting on values. 
So people that have the same values as you, that are actually going to come along with you for the ride, is not going to go against what's important to you because that doesn't help in a team either. But they can be totally different personalities, race, sex. It doesn't matter. It's about the values and are they actually with you? Um, so that comes into your attraction strategy. Are you using that? Are you um, identifying? Are you assessing them in your interview process? You probably do it for your clients to the nth degree. You don't do it for yourselves. So we'll just leave that on there. The induction onboarding program, six months. Have it set out. Have a six-month probation. It takes a while to get this job down. Uh, so make sure that uh, yeah, you've got it all structured for you. That will create their personal training plans to help with their retention. We've got in there that um, engagement strategy. That's where you would also do your empowerment framework, your appraisals, um, and that monthly and quarterly performance. And have minimum standards so everyone knows where the bottom line is so that they're not actually um, not don't know whether they're doing well or not because that's a critical thing as well. So when people start in their onboarding, minimum standards, these are the expectations. <coughs> Um, and then it's not about micromanaging it's not not about um keeping track of people it's letting people know what successful looks like so that when they come in if they're doing this you're going to be successful it's going to be good yeah it's really giving that sort of visual display as well so that you're always benchmarking and that's what I like I, I I personally love to have some of those tools and frameworks that you can bring in because it just helps to simplify a lot of things um, I find as well, you, you have a dog barking in the background, I hear, that's fine. <laughs> but don't go on mute, <laughs> I need you to talk. <laughs> um, absolutely, I see that Nikki is just asking, which I thought would be the case, um, that we're all looking for that slide, and we'll definitely make sure that we get that sent out to all the, um, all the viewers that have, uh, have joined us as well, because I think it's really helpful, that whole life cycle that you're really talking people through. Yeah, and it's, it's the elements of it. You can then just highlight, go, we got that, got that, got that. And you go, we've got a lot of this. This is great. Do we actually share this in our interview process? Do we let people know? Exactly. What we do for you? Yeah. So even just that engagement strategy, which was bottom left um, of one part of retention, that's all the lovely things you do for your staff. So whether that is training and development or whether that's socials once a month or all the benefits that you've got in your benefits package or fruit for the week that we're making smoothies on Friday. Please do that, guys. Don't throw the fruit out. Put it, get a smoothie maker and get everyone smoothies. <laughs> um, things like that that you actually put down on a document. This is yeah. our engagement strategy. Yeah. So again, everything's got a process to it. Everything's got logic behind it. But also, um, you can use it as your traction tool for when you're interviewing people. Look, here's our six month plan for when you start. Here's the engagement strategy of how we look after our people. Here's some of the comments on Glassdoor that people have put. So, engage, get your people that are working with you to put nice comments because we only tend to put comments when they're bad, don't we? So, again, make sure that you're getting those sort of recommendations from people you're working with as well, or use your testimony, whatever it is. But you've got to get it out there. You've got to let people know who you are, what you do. It doesn't matter how big you are, it's that they're going to buy into. Now, if they specifically want a big corporate, global then fine they're not even going to apply to you so you're not going to get a chance of those but all those other people that are looking let's let's go out let's let them know why they should be working with you but back it up because <laughs> if they then turn up and you're like oh, hey, excuse me it's on here <laughs> <laughs> it was a slide i got honest <laughs> but no it's all there i mean and we're here to support there's a lot of this as i say and we've, we've got over 200 sessions that are free for people so there's leadership and management stuff in there so there'll be some elements of this already and things like this are fantastic where we're sharing all of that detail uh, to make sure people have got opportunity um and then they can have a have a themselves. But if you want us to do the heavy lifting, then it is all on our website. Yeah, I mean I, I think ultimately what what is striking me there is as a business starts to grow, it has to start to mature. There's some tool tips there in order to actually take seriously as to what you are growing and putting that infrastructure in place because that's how you're really able to scale. Um, and then you have you go from one team lead to try and empower their teams, but then it gets even harder as well. But then you're trying to empower through team leads as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, and all of that is just part of you know the joy of the journey of growing an entrepreneurial business, isn't it? 
Yeah. And so listen, we're just coming to the end of here, which has been really good practical tips. So thank you so much for sharing them. Um, I always ask my guests, you know, a couple of things that they can take away right now. I think there's been loads that we can pick up. So what do you think would make the most difference in our audience? If you were just to summarize, these are the two things go away and think about right now. Okay, so there is another document that is on the green thing that you can go away and just get six answers very quickly. This is, um, if you're a manager, the communication, the six questions that your people want you to answer um, are in there. Now, that people plan covers all of those. So if you're doing that, you will get high scores on all of them. Um, mm. But go, go and have a look at this. This is Roger Dupree's six questions. He worked at Rank Zero Arts for 20 years and did a study into management communication, the impact it had on employees. So go and ask those questions, get your feedback, you'll see where you're not so great. Mm -hmm. That will then help you and lead you to the people plan. So go away, highlight and just say, okay, what have we got to work on in this next six months? What's got to be part of our plan to make sure that we are attracting good people, but we're keeping the ones that we've got as well, because that's going to be critical <laughs> this and, and up, upskilling them. Uh, don't leave them to just get on with it because they're busy. There's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. If they're busy, watch them, observe them, coach, feedback. You've got lots of opportunity to do it. It doesn't have to be structured training programs necessarily. I'm doing myself out of work here. But coaching, definitely, you, sh you should be having one-to-one -one coaching sessions with them every week. So you'll have picked up on something that they can develop every week. And, and that, every, that helps everyone that way. Mm -hmm. And, and thank you, Recruiter Zone. Um, I always take your compliments very seriously. <laughs> so thank you for posting the compliments. Um, Angela, you have been a star as always, and it's always just lovely to be able to um, uh, you know, come, come onto the screen and just get some of those sort of two tips shared. I know there's loads more if anybody is interested. You know, Zach's been posting up there in terms of um, you know, all, all the all the links and they're all there and we'll make sure. I actually think though there might be a wee bit of a um joint ebook that we could do together with bringing some of the, the context of this chat together. So if you're up for that, I'm sure yeah we can get our content teams working together to get that out for our audience as well because it's really valuable. Um and and I think you're absolutely right, recruiters have been scaling and now potentially we need to be scaling a little bit smarter rather than reacting in the first six months. So this is going to become very helpful. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And to everybody else, thank you also for subscribing. I think this is our fourth series that we've been doing. Um, I don't know if you saw on our LinkedIn, but we achieved 5,000 subscribers. Um, you know, we regularly achieve um, 100, and, 100 to 150 on our live shows um, within another 50 sort of following us as well. So we really appreciate you tuning in and giving me your, your ideas and guests, your ideas on what show was good, what show we could do better. Please keep the feedback. I love it. Um, and I know all my guests uh, enjoy being on the show as well. Um, so I hope it, it helps all of you out there. So thank you for tuning in and being part of our our big subscribers. Next one is 10,000. So our blog is 15,000. Crowdcast has got to go up to our 10,000. Uh, so, so please tell everybody um, and let them know if you're finding it helpful. Um, so it's coming up to holiday times. Please take some time out, you know, enjoy downtime. I'm trying to say this so that I actually take a holiday next week myself um, and, and have fun in the sun because I think we all deserve it. Um, and until next month, I will see you then. Angela, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.